So in this passage, uh, Paul defines who we are in Christ. Salvation and eternal life is ours forever through Jesus. We are adopted and predestined, part of God's eternal plan before we were ever put on the earth. Redemption, restoration, and reconciliation are all found in Jesus, and through our relationship with him, they belong to us as well. No one is perfect, but you are not defined by your failures. You're defined by his forgiveness. You're not defined by what others think of you. You're defined by the love of your creator. You're not defined by what you, what you did for God, but what God did for you. The more deeply we receive our identity in Christ, the stronger we are in our faith. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us identify ourselves in who you are, listening to your voice alone and to ignore the lies and deceit we receive. Lastly, I pray that you would bless each one of us this morning as Scott, Ryan, and Kyle bring us the message. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So now it's time for songs of praise and worship, so I invite Leanne and Pauline to come up. Good morning, everyone. Please stand if you're able, and uh, we'll start with 580, number 580. Number 615, 615.
number 800, 800. And eight thirty seven, eight hundred and thirty seven. <clears throat> Thank you. 
may be seated. So now is the time for scripture reading. So there's two passages today. Uh, the first one's taken out of Ephesians 5, 8 to 13, then the second, John 3, 19 to 21. So first I'll read the one out of Ephesians. So it was Ephesians 5, 8 to 13. And it reads, For you were once darkness, but now you are in the light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. So now I'll turn to John 3, 19 to 21. It reads, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So now it's time for the message. Good morning. It's uh, a joy to be with all of you this morning. My name is Ryan Yancey, and I'm just going to take a, just a, a brief moment to uh, share a bit of a, a personal update and then how that tran transitions into the message, and then I'll invite uh, Scott Rose and Kyle Gerber to come join me. Uh, so it's been a joy actually in the last uh, couple of months now to be around with Mapleview a little more often, and, and many of you are uh, familiar faces, and some of you are new faces, and so I'm, I'm uh, enjoying getting to know a number of you, and and especially younger folks, some of the some of the faces are vaguely familiar, and uh, so that also is a, a chance to get to know your your uh, your names and your your stories. Thank you for having my family and I uh, here with you as a church. It was October of last year that I finished up my time with Kingsfield Zurich Mennonite Church out in in Zurich, and started a new role with the Ontario Conference of MB Churches, the denomination that we're, we are a part of. And I'll just share in a in a moment a little bit more about who. ONMB is, but uh, yeah, just to say I was, I was working from home uh, for a number of months until we uh, were able to purchase a home in, in Kingwood, just down the road here. I'm still surprised that God saw fit for us to end up in Kingwood, and uh, but very excited. I have a strong sense that this is where God has called us and curious to find out exactly uh, what, what he has in store for us in this particular, this particular neighborhood. Uh, with my role with the Ontario Conference of Mennonite Brethren Churches, I work out of office space in Kitchener. Multiply, as you may know, is our global missions organization, and they have offices in uh, in Kitchener, where uh, Philip and Robin Serez work out of, and Aaron Coffee, and they got some space there. I'm I'm a extrovert, and so I I like I wither away if I'm at home in my office uh, too often. I need to get out and about, and so just to be with other people and to collaborate and whatnot. So that's actually at the Kitchener MB uh, Church Building on Ottawa Street in Kitchener. So I head in there a couple days a week, and then work from home. Um, as well. One other little note that I want to toss in there, thank you very much to all of you who took a took a moment to think about possible housing opportunities for Joel and Petra Martin. These are uh, dear friends of our families and uh, he is taking on an, a role with Multiply. He's going to be working with Kitchener also after uh, a decade of working with Youth for Christ in Madoc north of Belleville. So thanks so much for that and and real answer to prayer. Actually they're going to be moving this Thursday into uh, the home that Joy Gerber's been living in the last couple of years, just right beside Wellesley Public School. And I imagine that you will see them around as well as they settle into the community. And another note, if you're free on Thursday, have a few hours from four to seven, five to eight, whatever, when you're finished work or school, we are looking for a few hands to help move them in. They're uh, coming to a community where they actually don't know anybody except for, for our family. And so that would be uh, a real blessing. Just let me know, uh, touch base me after the service or shoot me a message if you are free to help move for a couple of hours. So I, I, I come to you this morning as as a part of our church family here at Maple View, but also on behalf of the Ontario Conference of Mennonite Brethren Churches. One of the reasons why I stepped into this new role, and it was, it was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't, wasn't looking for the next step, but uh, God had this in mind. It's because I am passionate about uh, churches working together. I think that when we work together, we can accomplish uh, more 
we uh, also can learn from one another, blessing each other, encouraging one another, resourcing one another. And, and no doubt that's felt at the level of pastors and church leaders as we're in conversation with, with each other, but then also at a congregational level. I do believe that, uh, yeah, we've got a lot to learn from each other, and uh, God wants to do uh, some significant things when we work together. So ONMB has uh, 30 churches, 30 approximately 30 churches across Ontario. Some of those are kind of affiliate churches or or ministries that aren't necessarily established as a church yet at this point, but 30 across Ontario, ranging from Leamington, kind of a hub in St. Catharines, a few in Kitchener-Waterloo, a few in the GTA, and then on up to um, Ottawa, as well as some First Nations initiatives in, uh, yeah, in Northern Ontario. We are a part of a larger church body, the Canadian Conference of Mennonite Brethren Churches. So that's 250 plus uh, across Canada. Kind of the, the strongest hub is out in, in uh, British Columbia. Uh, but certainly across Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and then uh, a couple scattered out on the East Coast as well. I imagine that over the years you've met our executive director, Ed Wilms, who's been here with you and uh, would have connected with you as a part of the transition of Mapleview into the ONMB family. And so Ed, and then there's an executive assistant, Christy Lee, they're based out of St. Catharines. And uh, so I, I head down there to work with them once in a while. We do a lot of Zoom calls, but that's just the joy of this this world of online connection and so it gives us opportunity just to be in distinct uh, regions so we just have we're spread out more geographically it's easier to connect with churches in different areas as well as it enabled us to to be in a place where Brittany could continue to work in uh, in Stratford so Ed and Christy are down in in uh, in St. Catharines and, and Christy is really the one that keeps the uh, the wheels turning looks after the nuts and bolts keeps us uh, in line I invite you along the way to stay connected with ONMB uh, you can reach uh, them. I think uh, forgetting what our actual like office email address is. Shoot, shoot me an email, uh, ryancey at onmb.org. We'd love to get our monthly newsletter in your hands just to hear what the churches are are up to. Uh, we invite you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, just a, a way. And we try to highlight, uh, yeah, what what is God stirring across the province so we can learn from each other and and partner. Another way that you can track along as well is I've been doing a, a, a podcast called uh, Jesus Stories, Inspiration for the Road Ahead. And I'm talking to various people uh, across ONMB just to hear how God is at work. So I invite you to check that out on whatever your uh, your podcast uh, platform is. And uh, so, yeah, highlighting, I had a great conversation with uh, with a fellow who comes from Pentecostal background, and, and he kind of highlights his journey into Anabaptism. He's a, a pastor down in, in Leamington or had a conversation, uh, it's going to be coming out uh, in two weeks, with a lady named Sandra Reimer. She's a part of Glencairn MB Church in Kitchener, and just kind of her journey of what it looks like to host spiritual conversations in her neighborhood, to be present, uh, yeah, with those who aren't a part of the church, who uh, aren't necessarily interested in darkening the doors of a church, but inviting them into these spaces to explore spirituality and uh, and share the gospel. So anyway, a variety of different uh, conversations like that. If you have ideas and say, hey, Ryan, here's a story that would be really helpful for you to feature, please let me know. I'd be uh, quite excited. Maybe you see God stirring something significant in someone in your in the church family here, maybe you that I should know about. Uh, would love love to do that. And so I invite you to track with, uh, with that podcast as well as with myself as I connect with different leaders. And uh, you can look me up at uh, Ryan underscore ONMB. Uh, on, on Instagram to track with that. So yeah, that's that's my usual uh, ONMB shtick. You know, I recognize this is a bit different uh, in terms of I'm not visiting a guest church. I'm I'm actually I'm a part of this church and and one of you, but that's the the usual usual shtick. And, and like I said, I really am passionate. I think that working together as churches is uh, a part of God's activity in the world today. So yeah, there you go. You can send an email to info at onmb.org to get our monthly newsletter, and then you can follow me on, on Instagram there as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to invite Kyle and Scott to come and join me at the front. Uh, Brent had asked me if I would be interested in, in preaching, and uh, as you're going to hear, one of the themes, uh, a journey that God's been inviting me into over the past two years now, has been experiencing uh, the power of confession. And I thought, well, I'm gonna, if I'm going to preach on this, i got to invite the two, two gentlemen that I've been on this journey with, and so we're just going to share with you a little bit what God's been been teaching. And and uh, I guess, I mean, Scott doesn't need any introduction here as a, an elder on the staff team. And and Kyle, for many of you, won't uh, won't need uh, introduction, but he is 
uh, minister at Faith Mennonite Church just down the road in Kingwood. Uh, grew up here. And uh, so, yeah, it's just been a blessing with these these two dear friends to be able to preach. We've never done this, try, try teaching. Uh, we'll see how this goes. you got two long-winded preachers over here and one wise fellow who's much better at choosing his words and being articulate. Uh, so Scott, Scott will keep us in a good time constraint, and we'll see what happens with, with Kyle and I. Um, but yeah, let's just have a word of prayer as, as we dive in. God, we invite you here. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your presence among us. And uh, we just say together, Jesus, we want to walk with you. We want to be faithful to you. Uh, thank you that we're known by you. And we just invite you to come more fully into our lives so that we could walk in freedom and hope. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, speak what you would have us here today. Highlight the things that we need to grab onto and then diminish the pieces that ought to fall away. We surrender ourselves to you. Um, come Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So it would have been about, uh, actually just about two years ago from from now, I think. It was the fall of, of uh, 2020. And uh, some of it was life journey. Some of it was just feeling the effects of of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ways that we were feeling kind of restricted and how that affected our own uh, emotional health, spiritual health, mental health for all of us in different ways. Now, uh, feeling some of that, I just had this sense of like, man, like I'm not in a good spot. I'm not in a good spot. I was just increasingly noticing the lack of peace in my heart. And uh, within that past year, it had a, uh, an event that, that troubled me. Um, and I was just discovering this like bitterness in my heart. Uh, there was a young man whom I, I'd poured into for for better part of a decade and spent a lot of time with our family. We're we're good friends; they love each other. Um, but this this gentleman who I just poured into and poured into and poured into and, and mentored and and uh, here there was a so you got this fellow and then you got a new church that's being started in Exeter, a, a church plant. And uh, the very first Sunday uh, of this church plant that afternoon, and you know I'd been in conversation, and as any of these things happen, that you know creates ripples within a community as as they're trying to share the gospel, and it's excellent. And as other people are kind of like looking around, and like is this a, a good good option for us somewhere to plug in? And anyway, that afternoon I'm sitting in my lazy boy chair and I'm scrolling Instagram, and I come across a post by this guy I've been pouring into, and here he went to the church that Sunday morning and was like hyping their pastor, and it just like it, I mean it sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud, but it just it pierced my heart. Uh, I felt betrayed. I felt like, you know, why is he going over here and hyping this guy when I've done so much, whatever, right? These nonsensical, egotistical ideas. But over the course of time, I couldn't shake him. My identity, my my perception of success as a pastor was uh, was shaken. And I had this bitterness in my heart that I had to work through, you know, toward toward him and toward this other church and the pastor of that church that I knew. And, and uh I was like, man, like I'm not in a good, I'm not in a good spot. And it's working itself out in my life in, in other ways. And these are the things that like you feel them and, and you, then you speak them out loud. And you're like, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I just can't shake it. Has anyone been in that, that place? And so that was my journey. And so as I was feeling this, I reached out to Scott and I reached out to Kyle. I was like, guys, like I need someone to like, just, we just got to chat, process life, pray together, uh, listen to the Holy Spirit together. Uh, how do you guys feel about uh, meeting up on a regular basis and just sorting through that stuff? So that's my journey. Uh, that's how God kind of brought me to this place of sharing in a life of confession with with Kyle and, and Scott. So I'll uh, I'll pass it to you fellas to to share your journey. Yeah, for me, uh, this journey kind of started um, almost exactly six years ago. Actually, I was on a at a conference in Colorado, and I remember. Um, Going into the conference, just had an uneasy feeling, um, knowing something wasn't quite right, and I, I, I thought like I gotta, I just have to do more. There's something I'm not doing. Like I was in, involved here at Maple View and doing lots of good stuff, but it seemed like I just had to do more. There's something missing. Um, but at, on that weekend, uh, God clearly told me that it wasn't more I needed to do. I, I needed to walk into His love and and learn what it was to be His child. Um, so that kind of kick-started this journey for me. Um, after that, I started, did a lot of reading and, and digging into my, my own brokenness, my own pain. Um, yeah, I did a lot of reading and, and a lot of, uh, yeah, working through some stuff on my own. But I, I also knew it would be good to have some friends to work through this stuff with, that, that it would be a good thing for me to do to have some support and, and uh, input from, uh, from other guys as well. But I don't know if I was too afraid to ask or... I never really, I never really uh, uh, pursued that until, um, yeah, it was a number of years later. Ryan said, "I'm, I'm working through this book. I'm, I've asked Kyle to, 
kind of go on this journey as well. Would you like to join us? And I said, yeah, that was a pretty easy yes for me. Um, I knew it was something that would be good and helpful for me. So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of what got me started on this. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, it's really an honor to be with you. And this congregation still feels, it has a feeling of home for me. And uh, so many of you have been such an important part of my life, of my growth and early spiritual formation for me. So this is a real privilege. And my family, Tracy and Greta and Felicity and Eloise are here. So this is good. I'm excited to share with you um, what God has been, how he's been continuing to shape me. Uh, a journey that started here at Maple View and the path it's taken us on. So for, like it did for many of you, uh, the pandemic brought challenges into our family life. Um, and COVID has been a bit like a pressure cooker, right? That um, it took little problems or things that seemed to be little problems and it's magnified them. It's made them bigger. Uh, as for me, as that pressure increased, what that looked like in our family life was that some problematic kind of behaviors and attitudes that had just seemed like surface level fractures were revealed for deeper cracks. And thankfully, in reflection, Tracy and I have sat down and kind of talked, what were some of those behaviors and attitudes that showed up? And so I'll share them with you, some of them. Uh, so maybe as I share some of them with you, you'll recognize yourself. Maybe as I share some of them, you will have somebody else in mind, maybe a spouse, uh, just refrain for the time being from <laughs> jabbing them in the ribs to help sink the point in a bit deeper. Um, so these are some of the, what I would call symptoms that not all was well with my soul. Uh, I wasn't physically present. Oh no, I was physically present in the house, but I wasn't really there. That I was constantly somewhere else in my mind, either trying to get work done or fixating on other problems instead of being present with my family. And so that was one thing. There was always a book I was trying to read while I was making supper and helping with schoolwork and trying to do too much at once. Another symptom was that even when I was asked the most innocent or petty questions, not petty questions, the most innocent or straightforward questions, I would give petty and hurtful responses. And this became a pattern. I wouldn't tell Tracy when I was distracted by a task that was important to me. And then because I was trying to solve this task in my mind, and then she'd ask me to help with some perfectly normal everyday routine thing, I would snap or react uh, essentially giving her the silent treatment or silently trying to punish her for not being able to read my mind while I simultaneously wasn't telling her what was important to me at the time. Uh, other things that showed up was I'd stay up late to try to get work done. I wasn't able to get done during the day, but I wasn't being productive when I was staying up because I was at that time then trying to fill up my leisure cup. So I would be trying to work and I'd also have a ball game or a hockey game on trying to do both of those things at once. I felt the need for margin and space in my life and unproductively getting at it. And then I would just get really frustrated with the children in ways that were unacceptable and, and too short tempered. So I say these on their own, these weren't on their own. Some of these were behaviors and attitudes that in and of themselves I needed to repent of on their own. Um, but they were also symptoms of something deeper going on within me. And I've learned, I think that that was a deep fear. In that moment, there was a deep fear within me of being exposed as a fraud, as someone who couldn't hold it together, like I communicated that I could, a basic form of pride. Right? If people really knew me, if people really knew how I was doing, I'm not sure they'd put up with me. They're going to discover that I am a fool. So I fought to hold it all together, but then the pressure of trying to hold it all together just fed that cycle of exhaustion and avoidance and self-pity. And so those cracks that were in my heart were just becoming increasingly visible. And it was in that context for me that Ryan reached out, said, hey, you want to help me uh, walk through this journey? I said, yeah, man, I'm right there. So that's what brought us to this point. Awesome. Yeah, so we're, we're all individually kind of struggling, looking at each other like, man, like Kyle's got it together. Like this guy's a, 
he's like a bluegrass musician and a <laughs> university professor and a minister and and Scott's just like so chill and even keeled and everybody loves Scott and just like tons of tons of wisdom and farming away like man these guys have it together and then he sit down and he started talking like oh <laughs> they don't have it together either <laughs> we're in this boat together and, and so by the grace of God we were invited into this journey of confession and what, what that actually looked like starting out uh, we would just meet uh, once every other week we'd meet out at Brenda's place give a shout out to Brenda's place in the north end of Stratford if you're looking for just a good home cooked meal good breakfast bakery like that's a great spot we're big big fans of Brenda um, so yeah every every other week we'd meet out at, at Brenda's place uh, 6 a.m. and we just start talking about life talking about what we were struggling with talking about the attitudes of our hearts and and really a lot of this is about attitudes you know there are certainly specific sins um, but sometimes we think of confession it's like well okay so confessing whatever I specific things but often it's the attitudes and the dispositions of our hearts that then work itself out in destructive and harmful ways so when we talk about confession what do we mean there's lots of ways we could define it but basically it's intentionally living in a state of openness and vulnerability with other followers of Jesus and that's kind of the joy of what we've been discovering and, and honestly the reason why I wanted to share this uh, today was it, it has had a profound effect within my life and I'm a little bit disappointed that it took me till I was 36, 37 years old to discover this. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it, yeah, it's been really powerful. And so our, our hope and our vision in sharing this morning with you would be to invite you to consider uh, what's stepping deeper. Maybe for you, it's the first time, maybe it's returning to what something you once did. Maybe it's just living more deeply into it, but what does it look like for you to step into uh, confession with, uh, with fellow believers because uh, I think that God has some pretty significant work that he wants to do uh, in this in this way. Right, I'll invite you to take your copy of the scripture, either open it up or turn it on or swipe it open, uh, and turn to Ephesians 5, the passage that was read for us. My job here in the next five minutes, five, six, seven minutes, is to explain to us why I think we must consider this. And I want us to think about the world the Apostle Paul invites us into here in Ephesians 5. And by the way, when Paul's writing these letters to the Ephesians or to the Philippians or to the Corinthians, who's he writing to? Who's his primary audience? Where, where does he expect for these letters to be read? I hear it being whispered. In the church, the audience for this is not those outside the church. Paul is writing to the church. We are his audience. And what I want to do is I want to draw our attention to verse 8 here to open things up. Paul describes this tension that we live in as followers of Jesus, who at one time, at once, we both we share in his light and his power over the forces of darkness, and we live in a world that's not yet completely free from the sting of sin and death. So these two things exist at once. And this combination is what Gerhard Voss calls the already and not yet. And that is an idea that emerged in Sunday school this morning. The already and not yet nature of God's kingdom. We understand that in Christ, we have been released from the bondage of death. But yet, as 1 Peter 4.13 says, we are privileged to still Share in the sufferings of Christ. As we continue to live, for example, with bodies, with families, with communities, and with churches that are still tainted by the effects of sin. And I want us to look here at this tension as Paul puts it in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, or if you're reading in the NIV, live as children of light. See, look at his statement about their identity. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Something has shifted. They've received the gospel. They've repented. They've received forgiveness of their sin. And with the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, they've transformed from darkness to light. So when Paul says you are light in the Lord, He's clarifying that for all of us as followers of Jesus, our identity as light is anchored, 
completely in Jesus. This is not something that we have discovered within us or something that we've opened up within us. Our identity is light is a gift that we've been given because of Jesus. It's an identity we have as long as we are united with Jesus. But then Paul tells us at the end of verse 8, he says at the end there, now we have to live into that identity. Even though the shift from darkness to light has happened, Paul tells them to live into this new identity where the darkness of sin no longer has dominion over them. See, they're now under a new master, a new master whose grace and mercy makes it possible to shed light into even the darkest corners of their lives. Remember, Paul's audience here is the church. And this matters because Paul's not suggesting that we need to live as children of the light so that we can experience God's grace, but rather he's telling us that it's God's grace that makes it possible to live as children of light. He's not saying that we do this until we get to a certain point and then we're good to go. No, he's saying, you have received this. Now, live like it. And the implication is he needs to tell us this. This is why it matters for us. He needs to tell us this because it is still possible for us to live in deeds of darkness. And if you look a little lower in verse 11, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. See, Paul is writing to us here about this already and not yet aspect of the kingdom of God. This is the world that we all share. Even though we are on the now live in the light side of the cross, Paul's understanding of the world is that we will have to engage in an ongoing battle between darkness and light. Just like the first audience of this letter, we have to actively resist the darkness by exposing it to the light. And what he means there by unfruitful works, this is important for us too, because what he means by unfruitful works is more common and more every day than we might think. And we won't turn to it, but if you'd looked just a little bit to the left in your Bibles, in chapter 4, he lists some of these things that he identifies as the unfruitful works of darkness. And they include things like falsehood, unrighteous anger, unrestrained sensuality, stealing, unwholesome talk, bitterness. See, one of the mistakes that we make is thinking of fruits of darkness as something other than us, something that's more significant than whatever petty little sins you certainly struggle with. God's word reminds us that it's just a matter of degree not of kind. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching us, and he talks about, you've heard it said, don't murder. I'm telling you what? Don't even hate. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you what? Don't even think, don't even lust. Don't even lust. Right? And what Jesus is telling us there is that these are not different kinds of things. He's saying they're the same thing, it's just a matter of degree. He says, if you so much as hate someone in your heart, you have already planted the seed that will end in your desire to remove them from your life. Right? If you allow the roots of lust to grow in your heart, that seed will eventually manifest itself. It is the same kind of thing. It's just a matter of degree. So if we're going to walk in light, we need to examine, for example, our desire to lie, our desire to tell half-truths, our desire to not explore where our anger or our bitterness is coming from. Right? Because those things are the seeds of something that will become more significant and serious. And I had to come to terms with this, that my anger and my bitterness was something serious that needed to be addressed. To be able to look someone in the eye and admit I was dealing with anger and rage because only then could I begin to explore the roots of fear, the roots of idolatry that were at the foundation. And the degree to which we are willing to take these things as seriously 
as we take the more serious sins, right? Whatever that means, right? The degree to which I'm willing to take a feeling of hatred as seriously as I would a feeling of murder, that's the degree to which Jesus Christ is able to shed light and to release me from that sin. And this matters because as a church, this tension, if we're going to have, like Paul, a realistic vision of the church, this is the main point of this little section, if we're going to have a realistic picture of us as a people inside the church, not all of those outside the church, we need a mature biblical perspective which understands that the fight against darkness is as active inside these walls as it is outside of these walls. That line between darkness and light doesn't stop at the threshold of the church. It runs right down the center of our hearts. And Zach Eswine puts it this way, speaking of our attitude towards our churches. He says, our church-going neighbors, for example, are tempted to believe that there's no weeds welcome in the house of God. They are forever reforming, weeding out, narrowing down the membership list. They speak to our neighbors about church only if they think they're worthy of getting in. Such neighbors are surprised to find sinners in church. The Bible isn't surprised by this. Zach Eswine continues, For other neighbors, if someone claims to follow God, goes to church, and then says or does things that malign God's name or hurts their neighbors, they're prone in their pain to leave off, not only with church, but also with God. Such neighbors are surprised when they find sin in churches. The Bible is not surprised to find sin and sinners in churches. In Ephesians, see, Paul knows he's writing to a church full of sinners. So what makes us live in community like we think we're not? In the same way as we criticize folks who are nominal Christians, we should equally measure ourselves to consider whether or not we are simply nominal sinners in our minds. And this is the, as I wrote this, this is the part that was the most exciting to me. If you forget everything else about what I've said, I would suggest you to remember this phrase, am I only a nominal sinner? So nominal Christians are uh, people in our communities who they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I was baptized into the church when I was a kid. I'm a Christian. And of course, when we would have a conversation with someone like that, we would ask them, perhaps, maybe you should examine your relationship to the God you say you follow. I want to suggest that often in the church, it's easy to have an attitude that we are nominal sinners. Yeah, yeah, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Really? What is your active and ongoing awareness of your sin? I would call a nominal Christian to say, you say you're following Jesus. Tell me about your active and ongoing awareness of the presence of Jesus in your life. Let's not be nominal sinners. Let us actively be engaging with the work of looking at what are the roots and the seeds of sin in my heart. I want us to think about what does it take to nurture this kind of community, to have a realistic perspective that leads to the groundwork for this. And I'll close this section with a quotation from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer says, The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everybody must conceal their sin from themselves and from the fellowship. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. And so we remain alone in our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is, we are sinners. But it is the grace of the gospel which is so hard for the pious to understand, that confronts us with the truth and says, no, you are a sinner, a great, desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to the God who loves you. You can hide nothing from God. The mask you wear in front of everybody else will do no good before him. He wants to see you as you are. He wants to be gracious to you. You do not have to go on lying to yourself and your brothers and sisters, as if you were without sin, you can dare to be a sinner. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Do we actually do that? I don't. I didn't. 
we say that we're a biblical people. We say that we uh, we apply the scriptures to our lives, but there's some of these that are kind of scary. They make us squirm, and we don't actually live these. I was sure I'd done it kind of in a vague sense at points over my 36 years. You know, when the opportunity arose, maybe in a small group or a conversation with a friend, maybe an accountability group, you know, I'd kind of vaguely like, oh, yeah, I struggle with pride or yeah, you know, I struggle with greed or I struggle with sexual lust or I struggle with getting angry sometimes. I struggle because I get frustrated with the kids, but always in a very kind of a general relatable sense. Not in a specific confessing of my sins. I confess my sins, but only in the most vague way that protected the image that I was still trying to cast to others around me, that I was generally a good, yeah, I was a sinner, like Kyle was saying, like nominal sinners, right? Like, yeah, I'm a sinner, but... Until life goes on, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm a wreck and this isn't getting any better. I need to confess my sin. And so our, our text today, actually, Matthew, or sorry, Ephesians 5, verse 11, it says, expose the deeds of darkness. Expose the deeds of darkness. Our text today challenges us to take those dirty, horrible sins, those points that we are so very embarrassed about and we hope no one actually ever discovers. Take these points and to expose them. The points at which we wonder and worry, if they actually knew this about me, they'd probably be done with me. But we're told to expose them, to not hold them private, to not dismiss them, to not permit them, to not gloss them over, expose them. And James chapter 5 gives us a pathway for doing that. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Hold them out in the open and shine the light on them. But this is hard. There are barriers in the way. Why is this so hard? Why have I lived so much of my life without a willingness to confess sin? Why have you? Shame is a pretty significant piece. We're filled with shame. And our text actually acknowledges that. Verse 12, it says it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. I was ashamed to name the things across the table to my brothers, the things that I've done and the things that I've said, the things I was feeling. It's embarrassing, this sense of like, oh my goodness, like I can't believe that I've done this. I can't believe that I've thought this. And we've got the deceiver whispering in our ears, doing what he does best, deceiving, saying, if they truly knew who you are, they'd be done with you. They would push you away. They wouldn't respect you. They'd never trust you again. Of course, we're called to confess our sins to Jesus. He is the only one through his life, his death and resurrection, through his shed blood of the cross. He, wait, he makes us as white as snow. He purifies us. He calls us saints. We need to be living this life of confession to Jesus. He already, he already knows our sin. And it's easy to lapse into the sense of, well, of course Jesus is going to forgive us. That's his job. That's who he is. That's what he went to the cross for. We receive the forgiveness of Jesus on a deeply spiritual level. But confessing to other people? No way, I'm not doing that. Way too much shame. And I think when we give into the shame, we're denying the opportunity for the gospel to break more fully into our lives. And so kind of extending uh, our story of confession a little bit further, we did this over a number of months. We were working through a book called uh, Soul Care by Rob Reamer. You may have heard me reference that book. I think I preached maybe a year and a half ago uh, and mentioned that. If you're looking for a guide of just like growing in your own personal spiritual development, digging into kind of your inner wounds, your inner sin, all that stuff, Rob Reamer's book Soul Care is a great guide. And so we're working through this book, and he brings up this idea of a total life confession. And so we got to this point, we're like, all right, a total life confession. It sounds super scary, but these weeks, bi-weekly meetings of beginning to kind of express a little bit more and a little bit more, almost like testing the water. I'll confess this to you. And then seeing that response of grace being drawn further in, exposing one bit of darkness after another to one another. You know, this week I've been closed off to my wife because this, this, and this. This week, you know what, I actually did go down the path of gossip about another, you know, in my role about another church leader because I I felt this, whatever. Giving these things, and each time the response was one of grace. 
and seeing in my brothers a physical affirmation of what I already knew to be true. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's so much truth in there. And yet I think even as we receive that fully from Jesus, I think that we fail to truly believe or truly feel it because we've never actually experienced it fully from sisters and brothers around us. And so this preparation of months of, of kind of minor confessions led us to this point of a total life confession. And so we got together one Monday in March of 2021 and kind of wrote this out. And we all kind of had like an hour or so and just laid it all out on the table. Everything, whole life story. And uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was frightening. It was scary. I really didn't want to do that. Um, yeah, and it was hard. I didn't like what I saw in my life. I didn't like what I saw, what I discovered about who Kyle is. I didn't like what I discovered about who Scott was. Like, let's be honest. Like, we learn things about each other, our attitudes and behaviors, which were sinful. They weren't on the pedestal that I thought I had them on. I wasn't on their pedestal if I ever was in the first place. But we confessed our sins to one another. And what was beautiful, what was so beautiful, honestly, going into that, like having this fear of like, you know what? They might have every right to be like, Ryan, like, you're a good dude, but can't believe this. Like, and just slowly back away. But that's not what happened. It was a leaning in toward one another. And this experience in the grace and mercy of God that we already knew and received, but seeing it in a physical, concrete way. We believe that we're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Because we're the physical demonstration of his work on the earth today. He's ascended to heaven. He's given us the spirit. And Jesus Christ pours out his work in the world through us. And so would not a logical extension of that be when we confess our sins to one another, we have the opportunity in a physical, concrete way to receive the mercy and grace of God through one another. Don't hear me wrong. I don't believe that in order to receive God's forgiveness, it has to be mediated through someone else. If you've never done a life confession, if you've never confessed your sin, you're still under the mercy of God. But to actually see it in the flesh through a Christian sister or brother is a powerful thing. And so I believe that actually that, that day, and I, you, know, I, you don't necessarily need, I mean, I'd love to see you all do a total life confession. Whatever that looks like, confession looks like for you or those steps into that that you take. You know, that day for me, and my heart would be for you as you try on confession, that you would experience the grace and mercy of God in a new way. I actually, I love it. And, and actually, after these conversations, I mean, we had to go home and have some deeper conversations with our spouses because we kind of kidded. We're like, you know what? We know each other better than our wives know us now at this point. So then opening up about some of the stuff with our, with our wives. Um, but I've experienced peace of Jesus in a deeper way. Because now I can enter a room, I can sit across a table for breakfast with two fellows who actually know me and I can truly be who I am with them. And that's a gift from God. And Satan does not want you anywhere near that. So actually there was one time I'm kind of telling, I'm sharing about some life dynamics and now there's capacity as well to kind of call each other out. Be like, you know what? Like, you confess this and I'm seeing it kind of work itself out in your life. So it's a beautiful thing. Like, you're right. It's like a, a mirror being held up. Anyhow, there's something beautiful and powerful in the physical relational realm to experience being fully known and yet fully loved in a way that breaks through so that we can experience God's love and mercy in a new and tangible way. Stepping into a pathway of mutual confession meant that I was no longer living in darkness, but was able to live more fully in the light of Jesus. Isaiah 9-2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. It's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the light. The day that Jesus was born, the shepherds were out watching their watching their sheep and the angels angels came the glory of the lord shone around them the wise men followed the light of the star to the light of jesus we talk about um saul on the road to damascus 
you know, he was struck down by a bright light. Um, and that day he met Jesus. And in Revelation, um, we're going through that in Sunday school, um, the new Jerusalem is illuminated by the glory of the Lord. It's that light. It's that same light. It is the glory of the Lord, Jesus, the light that shines, that illuminates the darkness in each one of us. It is that light that can shine into the deepest, darkest parts of us that we want to keep hidden. It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing to allow Jesus to see those parts of us. It's not It's not fun. And it's not fun to let other people see those parts of us. So so what I, what I do, what I did is I, I distract myself. I keep myself busy so I don't have to, I don't have to go there. I don't have to look into myself, allow Jesus to look into myself and see, see what's really going on. Um, stay busy. I avoid it. But deep down inside, I want to be seen. We all want to be seen. Um, it's one of our core needs is to be seen, seen by Jesus and to be seen by others. We can't be truly loved until we're completely seen. You know, we can put on the mask, we can, we can make things look good and people will love that. But that's not really us they're loving, it's that fake, that fake self that we're putting on. But we all have this, this desire, this need to be seen. The, the shame that each of us carry about, about things we've done or things that have been done to us, that needs to be seen, to be healed. Um, we can't carry around shame without it having an Im- impact on our lives. Sometimes a physical impact, emotional, uh, spiritual. Um, shame affects us in ways that we don't realize often. And until it's seen, um, we can't get rid of it. It won't be healed. But shame hates the light. Shame likes likes darkness. Satan Satan likes for us to keep that that hidden. Um, shame does not like light. Um, but we need that light. We know we need that light. We know we need that shame to be to be uh, seen. Um, and once we have experienced that, had that experience of of bringing those things into light. To, to Jesus and to others, we, you just want more of it. Um, when you experience the light, you want more light. When you experience the healing, you want more more of that healing. Um, and it's not a one-time thing. It's not something that you do once and bam, you're healed. Everything is good. Um, there's, always, there's always more things to bring to the light. Um, but it's still difficult. Even when you've experienced that, it's still... There's still a part of me that wants to keep those things hidden, but I know what it's like to bring those things out and to be healed. Um, Kurt Thompson says this, Confession is not just an act in which I dictate to people a list of my sins. Confession is my embodied action of revealing the whole truth of who I am in the presence of someone else who, when I see them receiving the whole of me, the part about me that longs and dreams and desires, as well as the parts about me that I hate and that are dark and black and awful. When I see them receiving that, I see in their face the message, I still want to be in the room with you. You can't, you can't make me leave. In that way, my confession is an opportunity for me to not be alone. It is the gospel coming to me. It's when we have that experience of, of being seen and that person doesn't doesn't get up and leave. You can see in their face, in their eyes, saying like, "I love you, I hear you, I love you. I'm not going anywhere." Um, that's when the light breaks through. That's when the brokenness and the shame and the hurt and the trauma and all those things can be healed. It's through confession. Confession to Jesus through confessing to others. Romans 8, chapter 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Romans 2, 4, it's God's kindness that leads us to redemption, to repentance. Confession does not lead to condemnation. Confession, if, if you have experienced confessing someone to, something to someone, and they have brought you more shame and more condemnation. That wasn't Jesus. It wasn't Jesus. Confession brings light. 
the devil wants us to believe that if we confess, then that will bring condemnation and more shame. But true, true confession does not do that. Confession brings freedom. It's not, it's not the end point, it's the starting point. It opens the door to freedom and healing. It's not an instant fix of our problems. There's still lots of work to be done. But without confession, we cannot start that work. And I know, I know what it is. I know what it's like to see those eyes on someone when I confess something and, and you can see it in their eyes. Our, our faces don't lie. Our words can. But when you experience the goodness of, of sharing with someone and, and seeing their response, um, it's good. It's real good. And when you experience that, you, you want more. When you know what it's like to walk in darkness, walk in pain and shame, and you receive healing from that, um, you don't want to go back and walk in that darkness. So my question is, is, will you allow that light to shine into your dark places? Will you allow Jesus to bring the healing and peace into those places? And then I know it's not easy, and I know it, it is painful, um, but it is worth it. Thanks, Scott. And to add to that that idea of, of, of the pain, you know, if, if you're going to... Sin is destructive to relationships, so confessing sin, particularly if it's been private sin, and, and I'll say if it's if you confess sexual sin to your spouse, it's going to hurt and there's going to be tears, but it's also going to create this pathway through the pain to lean in together and to experience that freedom and that joy and the beauty of of the light. So just to add to that, of like it's not we talk, oh, confession's so great, you shine the light. It's crazy hard. <laughs> it's really painful. But on the other side of that pain is this freedom, this joy, this light. Ephesians chapter 5.13 says, but everything exposed by light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So it's not simply that I'm here in my sin, the light gets shone on me and it just exposes all the sin and then I'm just like, okay, so God loves me and there's just all the sin. There's a transforming power to the light. It says here, everything that is lit up, so you and your sin are lit up and you become a light. There's a transforming process that happens when there's confession that light shines and the holy spirit begins to work to change you and to redirect you to become that person who lives in the light who is actually light i'm gonna read a, a quote here from a friend of kyle's who's a, a therapist and he actually you picked it up on facebook or instagram the other day checked in with her and she said it'd be just fine to share this she said i was talking with a client today about some really hard things that she's walking through right now and she acknowledged that part of what feels hard is that she feels alone in it when I asked her about her support system, initially she said her family. I followed this up by talking about support in a physical way. Who is showing up for you? Like who knows how you're really doing? Who gives you a ride if your car has died? Who would pick you up or drop you off for ice cream? Or pick you up or drop you off at the airport? Who are the bonus aunts for your kids who pick them up for ice cream and show them their things and cheer loudly for them from the sidelines? Who are the bonus sisters who come spend a day with you and hug you and bring you coffee and sit with you and pray with you? No one. The silence that hung in my office after this was deafening. And the person proceeded to say, I feel so disconnected from people in my life. And the therapist then reflects, as I move through life and see Jesus and see growth, seek growth, I'm becoming convinced solidly that the text every so often to check in sort of community that we often settle for is a far cry from what we're meant to do. Deeply relational and deeply interdependent Christianity is terrifying, but I'm convinced that we can't grow without it. If my story is not deeply known by people in my life, there is no place for truth to be spoken into it. If people don't know the depths of who I am, my sin and brokenness, how can they truly speak the grace and mercy of God into that? There's no place for people to graciously ask questions and call me out when I need it. There's no rub from others who are different from me that can offer growth-producing perspective. There is no place for Jesus to tangibly enter my soul and redeem it. We don't re redeem others, but we're here to embody our Savior in each other's lives. 
I wonder what we would look like as the body of Christ if we stopped hiding and building walls and pretending to be perfect and put together. I think we would flourish as God's people. I think our faith and how we walk, that it would rock our communities. I think that we would know a freedom greater than we've ever experienced. And then this therapist pointed to the words of a fellow named Paul David Tripp who said, we need to let go of the Jesus and me isolated independent Christianity. It's one of the biggest lies actually we've been sold in the kind of the broader evangelical world that is just Jesus and me and that's sufficient. The Christianity of the New Testament is deeply relational and interdependent. And so with all of this, I invite you to consider what does a life of confession look like for you? Who will you confess to? Not everyone is safe. It's not something that's to be cast to the whole community. You know, we haven't said here the depths of what we've all processed together. But who is someone around you who is safe, who you trust? Maybe it's a dear friend. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's an older uh, or just someone wiser, more advanced in their faith that you see. And, and maybe you don't even know them well, but you really look up to them and you trust them. Maybe that's who you're called to reach out to. And maybe because the depth of your trauma, it's terrifying to even consider voicing this to someone else. Maybe where you need to start with is with a good Christian therapist or counselor within the bounds of confidentiality. Maybe that would be a good first step. And so we invite you to take this, take the plunge, to shine the light on these deeds and expose them. What are the 2%? What is the 2% of sin in your life that you've sworn to yourself, I'm taking this to my grave. No one is ever going to know this. What is that? And as you think about this, I'm quite certain that Satan is lying to you in this moment saying, no, nah, like that's maybe other people can do this, but you can't do that. Satan's lying to you. He doesn't want you to do this. What is that 2%? Invite the Holy Spirit to guide you in this. And we're just going to say, we're going to make ourselves available after the service. We'll just kind of chill out at the front here. Um, we'd be happy to chat if that's maybe your first step in terms of confession. But we certainly urge you to seek out someone you know deeply and trust. And honestly, if you come and chat with us, nothing is going to surprise us. We know that there are marriages within this room that are miserable and nobody knows. We know that some of you are addicted to pornography. We know that some of you just can't resist that dopamine hit you get every time when you dig into a big juicy bit of gossip. We know that some of us have lost our cool on our kids in ways that we don't care to admit, even having laid a hand on them at times. There's so many deeds of darkness. We are sinful people, but none of us, none of that will surprise us. And the good news is God is faithful and just, and he forgives you. He has forgiven you, and he wants to set you free. I'm just going to pause. Sorry, we have gone a bit longer. Like I said, that's maybe what you get when you got a couple ministers in the mix trying to figure out a sermon together. Uh, but I'm just going to ask this question. Who are you going to practice confession with? When will that happen? How will that happen? So I'll give you a moment to think and pray about that. Who will you begin to practice confession with? When and how? But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.